Hashtag worst of. Hashtag rage inducing. Hashtag Lord give us strength. That's right. What we disliked the most in 2019. That and more on today's episode of The Real Review. So stay tuned. Welcome to The Real Review. Welcome to The Real Review, sponsored by Parametric and Lazy Ape Studios, where you get some of the latest happenings, real thoughts, and perspectives in the world of film and television. I'm here with Matt. Would you like a glass of milk? Hey. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, um, everybody, I'm here with... I'm referring to it all. Like, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm here with Joel <laughs> One-Shot Cunningham. Yeah, similar references yes, there. Yes, exactly. People had a chance to see that in 1970. Stuck film. with me. I still think about that movie. I, yes, I would say out of all the World War One inspired films I've seen, mm-hmm. that was actually the most, like, I felt... As if I kind of was in World War One. Yeah. And it was obviously due to the cinematography and the style, the one shot and everything like that. But yeah. just the way they were like in the tunnels and everything like that and in the, the oh, trenches yeah. that you really felt like, hey, uh, this is probably what it would have been like. For yeah. People back then. yeah. It's insane. It's and movie. we'll probably do a, I'm thinking we'll do a review on that soon. Not on this episode, yeah. but yeah. 1917. Wow. Yeah. Let me just say this right now. Mm-hmm. The last episode where we talked about our best top 10 films. Yes. I, I gave the caveat, and so did you, that mm-hmm. if we saw something that we hadn't seen <laughs> that came out in 2019, we had the right to change our list. Mm-hmm. I'm changing my list. 1917 is in my top 10. Wow. There Boom. you go. I probably would. Yes. I would probably add it as well. I, I need to go back and figure out exactly where. Yeah. I know, don't have those nothing details else, yet. I just know it's- honorable mentions. I know it bumps it bumps crawl out of the top <laughs> 10. So- <laughs> wah, wah. Wah, wah, Sorry. Wah. No, more, no more alligators. No more alligator scariness. One's yeah. fake fear. One's real fear. You yeah, know, exactly. War and stuff. So anyway, welcome to The Real Review. Uh, here, Matt and I- Matt and I- Matt. Yeah. Matt and I like to do things um, kind of our own style. Matt has a tendency to be a bit more of sort of the fan- uh, emotional fun perspective, whereas I tend to be more the analytical, uh, break things down, fine tooth comb type perspective. Uh, and so we put those together to give you kind of like the whole approach, the whole two sides of the coin, if you will, of f- film reviewing. Uh, yeah, we decided to have you joining us here as we talk about our worst films of 2019. Right on. Matt, why don't you give our listeners some ways to get connected before we get into those films, however? Yeah. Yeah, you can get connected with us a number of different ways uh, that, uh, well, you can start off on the website. It's probably a great place to be, um, realreviewmedia.com. And uh, you can connect to all of our socials from there. So that's Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at Real Review Media. Again, Real, R-E-E-L. And um, you can also reach out to us if you have any questions or want us to uh, check something out that we haven't seen. Um, I know somebody asked me about Parasite. I haven't had a chance to see it yet. Everybody keeps telling me to see Parasite. I know, I and I haven't it. had a chance to see it yeah. yet. But like, that's a great place to put the, throw those suggestions out there. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, you can reach us at realreviewmedia at gmail.com there. Yes. Yep. We have a lot of films to catch up on because of the Oscars coming up here yes. sooner rather than later. So. You and I, that reminds me, we got to do our picks. we got to solidify our picks. We should solidify our picks. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I have a few thoughts. So yeah. yeah, we should definitely do that at some point. For sure. Cool. Well, let's get right into it then. Talking about our worst of. I'm sure many people are eagerly <laughs> been awaiting this one. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is where I always get slightly disgruntled again, even more disgruntled than my <laughs> usual self. Um, Matt, I have a few dishonorable mentions. Do oh, you have come any on. dishonorable mentions? I don't mentions? have any because of course not. you saw more worse movies than I did. Yes. I <laughs> I will just go through them like real quick. I'll just run them, throw them out there. Yeah. Um, just Do so it. people know that, yeah, hey, I got a lot of films that I didn't <laughs> like. Uh, three dishonorable mentions for me. One, Velvet Buzzsaw. Hey. Um, one I was actually really excited about when I heard the initial kind of like release details mm-hmm. of it, Jake Gyllenhaal. Yep. And kind of like a quirky satire Um I was like, hey, I like satires. I like Cheek Jill and all. It's yeah. going to be a great film. And it just flopped. Yep. It really had nothing to it. Uh, didn't have any teeth, even though it had a lot of horror. Mm-hmm. Um, another one that I was really expecting, and some people might be angry about this one, but It <laughs> Chapter 2. Um, Ooh. I really was not super pleased with what they did with the second one. It felt like they tried to have their cake and eat it too, where they tried to d- put the time between the kid's story, which uh-huh. was supposed to have been done and yeah. completed in the first film. Yeah. But they're like, hey, we got these big stars and they're super famous now and everybody loves them, so we got to get them in the second film. Uh-huh. So they tried to put them in there, but then it ended yeah. up diluting the, the the tone and the feel of the second movie because sure. 
part of the suspense of the film is like, hey, these people could die at any moment. Right. But when you go back in time with characters you know that are currently alive and fine, it's like, well, they're not going to die. So it's still jumpy, but it's not anywhere near as effective. Um, so yeah, I didn't really enjoy it as much. And just the overall story and everything like that. I didn't hate it, but just was disappointed sure. personally. And again, disclaimer, we haven't done this disclaimer yet, but um, these are Matt and I personal opinion on films. You might have films on here that you didn't dislike all that much. They might be your favorite films of the year. These are just ones that us and I'm being emotional, Matt's being emotional, yeah. have emotionally impacted us in the most negative waves throughout 2019. Yeah. Yep. And so it's not even to say that they're bad films. It's just to say that I had a bad viewing experience with them. Mm-hmm. So uh, last but not least, and this was on Matt, probably is going to be like, what? <laughs> uh, John Wick Chapter 3. I really did not. Well, I don't know. Yeah, okay. It wasn't your best films. I, I, I like the first two films. better than the third one. Yeah. I, the story to me with this was, was a little better mm-hmm. as far as I felt like they were more grounded, even though it was kind of outlandish going to the desert and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And the bringing in of like another fighter that's like, that was my main problem with this one. It kind of diluted the idea of who John Wick was mm-hmm. by adding other people that were just like, they weren't anywhere near as well trained or, you know, notoriety, didn't have the notoriety that John Wick had. And they were just as effective as killers as he was. Mm-hmm. And then it kind of just, it felt boring. Like after a certain point, it's like, okay, we're just going to see this other fight where this person dies and this person <laughs> dies and that. So yeah, that was yeah. it. Yeah. So. I think, I think that's what you expect at John Wick. I, I think they just have to get inventive in the ways that they do it. Like Exactly. Yeah. The whole first scene is so it's like death by library kind yeah. of a thing, you know? And <laughs> I think- much. I think that's, I think it's that kind of stuff they get in. Or yeah. like, you know, they do the motorcycles with the swords. Yeah. and It started know. off on a high note for me. Yeah. And I think one of the things with John Wick 2 that I didn't like was how they built it up into this whole like universe of assassins. And I was well, like, it's always kind gonna... of been like that. Yeah. The the problem I had was like, well, they like in the end of the second one, not to spoil it too much, but like they turn pretty much everybody that's around him into an assassin. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of part of the problem with this third one. It was like, how many assassins are there? Yeah. Why are they all here? It's just, it was, <laughs> it was so much death of just so all many randos. Central Park is yep. an assassin. Pretty much. That's how they ended it. So it was just so much yeah. randomness, I think. The first fight I really liked in John Wick 3, but after that, it kind of was just like, whatever. Sure. Anyway. I did my dishonorables, okay. so I'm going to let you go ahead and take it with our number 10. Yeah, I don't have any dishonorables again, um, but I, I think to echo what you said, I my my worst 10 mostly have to do with just me being disappointed. Yeah. Uh, and it was something that I was pretty excited about. Yeah. Some of them aren't that I was super excited about. They were just bad movies. Right. But uh, yeah, let's start off. Number 10. 10. Dumbo. Dumbo. <laughs> yes. Yes. This this movie took um it's fine. I mean, I think it made made some money. Yeah, it's um Disney, you know. I will say it's release. been it's been a better one of the better uh works of it's not saying a lot, but one of the better look works from Tim Burton a while, in a while. Um it's it's the thing I don't like about it is it's more of a people movie than it is about Dumbo m- yeah. movie. And, and I get that it's hard to relate and connect to a, a, an elephant, a baby elephant. But I think whenever Dumbo was on screen, that's, those are the best moments of the movie. Yeah. Um, but when you're following the, this family and like learning about where they're coming from, the plight of the father and the daughter and, and like, you know, the whole, the whole thing. And um, it just, it, it took the, it just, it feels like, you know, you're on a freeway. This freeway is the Dumbo freeway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they took an off ramp onto a different freeway. Oh, wow. And it was just like something else with this like yeah. side character called Dumbo who happens to be a baby elephant. I will say, I don't think if there was a freeway called the Dumbo freeway, I would drive on it. I feel like it'd be full of a lot of bad drivers. What if, what if there were flying baby elephants everywhere? If that were the case, that would be different. I would maybe yeah. go on the Dumbo freeway if yeah. I had to ride on the flying elephant one can only dream <laughs> one day you yeah. know tesla get to work on yeah. that come you know, on elon, Musk, elon. flying elephants <laughs> what's your number 10 anyway yeah my number 10 um captain marvel oh surprising one maybe for some people who, surprising i like captain marvel yeah some people liked it i i had a rough time with this movie mainly one of the biggest reasons is it it didn't do emotionally anything for me and there's been some Marvel movies in the past that have done that. You know, Iron Man 2 and 3 were kind of disappointing out fairs for me. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the Thor later, you know, uh, Thor 3 was good. Thor 2 was not. Um, even Captain America, um, I believe the second one. There's just been times with Marvel films where I, it's like I see where they were going with it. Mm-hmm. But maybe due to a lack of 
um, planning or a lack of, you know, coordination between the actors and the studio and the director and the producers, just something hits off and it doesn't go and land quite yeah. the way that I was hoping it would yep. and was expecting it to. Um, this movie kind of does it. I think one of the main driving factors for it in in many ways was um, with Carol Danvers, the character, they didn't create to me enough of a sense of like the stakes that she was, that she was, that I was trying to root for her for, Yeah, you know, even with Thor, the first movie where I thought it was just average film, it was funny and it was good at times. You understood it's like, here is this man that's got this power has been a God has got a lot of ego. He's arrogant. He is arrogant and lost that. And he's fighting to regain that yet something to root for this movie. I never really understood what, in a sense they were fighting for it was kind of just like in it was more of like an internal struggle mm-hmm. against ambiguously bad forces that were out there but then they kind of switch sides and you're like halfway through the movie you're like well wait that and then that it just kind of felt muddled i didn't really get the driving force i think as well as the the personality that they went with for carol danvers mm-hmm. was like it was in a sh- it was in a shade of iron man tony stark mm-hmm. but it went too far to the point where to me personally it felt mean like oh, really yeah with tony stark you kind of get he's quirky and he's arrogant yeah. and he's big-headed but you know he's this savant of like intellectual you know business and he's done all these yeah. big things it's like with carol danvers you're just powerful you mm-hmm. just have power you've never really s- done anything to prove that you can be taken as this like egotistical and and as well with tony stark there's a heart there with Danvers, it kind of just felt like you're just powerful and bad things have been happening to you. Yeah. But you just kind of have to overcome those. So um, hmm. not to belittle it, belittle okay. what they went through with the story or anything like that. It just didn't really do much for me. It was one of my lower rated films for Marvel for sure. Okay. Uh, end of the year, just more disappointing because I expect better story stuff sure. with with Marvel. And there was other things that were going on with Samuel Jackson, Yeah, which I liked in the movie, but the cat thing I did not like. I did not enjoy. The um, flurkin? Yeah, the flurkin. <laughs> just such a, like, okay, right, that's what we're going to do with the eye thing. Yeah. <laughs> stuff like that. So, anyway, that's all I'm going to yeah, say. Yeah, I didn't mind any of that stuff. <laughs> cool. Well, that was my number 10, Captain Marvel. Yeah, and you can send your rage comments to matt at yeah. Um <laughs> Last, uh, so let's let's go to number nine here. Yep. Um, this, this one probably... Um, falls in line with what I was talking about last time with movies that I feel like are just made either just to be mean spirited or just to get, to be downers. Um, and that's going to be, uh, num- my number nine is the pet cemetery remake. Mm. Um, man, talk about a downer. Not that uh, movies have to be like super positive for me to like it. Yeah. I thought the Joker was a fantastic movie. I just never want to watch it again. <laughs> um, but I think that, um, Pet Cemetery was just being mean. Like it's it's a dark it's dark content mm-hmm. and and all that. But there were like there was no punches pulled. It was all out like and some there was some different misdirection stuff than what we've seen in the past. But other than that, it's 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 pretty straightforward, mean, bleak, depressing. Someone who is a parent of children. Yeah. It's it's kind of heart wrenching a little bit in a way that's like, Oh gosh, I don't like, I don't know if I need to be watching this, <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, it was competently made. I'm not, you know, gonna knock on the, the filmmakers at all. Other than I think it was the screenplay maybe in which they, in the direction they decided to take it and leave it, uh, on the cliffhanger they left it on. Yeah. Um, so anyways, I, I'm not much more to say in that. It was just, it was just kind of a, just a dark movie for the sake of being dark a bit. Yeah. Yeah. There's no optimism and no hope, nothing mm-hmm. like e- even in those movies, you have maybe a little bit in the like middle, like maybe we can turn this thing around, but <laughs> you know, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> Pet Cemetery, the original one is actually one of the horror movies I've actually seen. I remember watching it. Yeah. I, Cause that came out when I was still a kid. And I wasn't allowed to watch a lot of yeah. horrific movies, but my parents wanted to watch yeah. it. And I actually remember that having a pretty bleak ending. Yeah. The original one. It does. So spiritually, maybe they kept it similar, but there's so many bleak horror movies coming out now. I totally I get your point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's just too much. I like the <laughs> horror movies where they like, like defeat the, the evil at the yeah. end, you know? Yeah. And I feel like too much the evil's winning and I don't like that. <laughs> yeah. They've kind of gone in that direction with modern horror. Yeah. For sure. It's yeah. like, there's, there, there's never a happy ending right. potential. Yep. So, cool. Uh, my number nine mm-hmm. is a film... 
I seem to see these kind of films every time more than you once a year at least. Um, uh, Good Boys. Okay. It's a comedy. Yep. Of sorts. I remember you talking about it. Yeah. I uh, when I may, when I say I tend to see these movies, I tend to always see like the really bad comedies. I feel like in the year that are <laughs> just do. like I think you do the R-rated bad comedies. Um, this one was kind of billing itself as like a coming of age tale. Mm-hmm. Um. But with like a much, much younger type kid, um, which in and of itself isn't a bad idea, but it also is limiting because it's kind of like, well, it, I don't really want to see young, young kids engage in like really, in a comedic yeah. sense, engage in like really bad yeah. stuff, like maybe in a horror film. Yeah, we, yeah or I, like remember, I remember us talking about this. Yeah. yeah. And it wasn't even, even, what it was there for comedic effect wasn't funny. Oh, yeah. It just, it never landed in a way. I think everything, every single one of the jokes you saw coming from a mile away. Mm, yeah. um, there was maybe one or two moments that kind of so, caught me yeah. off guard and surprised me, which okay. is a really bad thing. Right. Um, with comedy, you need to have a sense of like suspense and newness. And yeah. uh, if you can't do that, then it's probably not going to be very funny. Right. Uh, I really feel like the whole joke was kind of like, Hey, we're making an already comedy, but look how young they are. Look, they're young and they don't understand what kissing is. And we're gonna go like way too far with the whole oh kissing thing. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it just it felt like a two tone movie. It felt like they they wanted to have this like adult side of it with like adult adventures and like more mature themes, but then keep that so much in the background yeah. that they could rely on just having the main three boys in the film. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't like they did a bad acting job. Like I wouldn't fault the kids. It was really just a really bad script. Mm. Just really, really bad script. Nothing to speak of in regards to cinematography or, you know. Anything else yeah. as far as filmmaking. There of- could be some editing aspects there as far as pacing. Like maybe they, they had better ways of pacing the content out to make it feel a little bit better. Yeah. Um, and they didn't do that. Um, but it just... I don't know. None of the kids, I didn't connect with any of the kids' story because they were so ridiculous. Mm-hmm. You don't really want them to succeed. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Like a film that I would compare this to, but like on a more mature side would be like super bad. Okay. Well, that's what people are calling it, like a, yeah. like a spiritual prequel right. to super bad. With super bad, you kind of, because the kids are, and I hate to say this, but because their kids are kind of realistic to what yeah. their age is probably like, you can understand them. You can relate to them better, even though you don't like what they're doing a lot of the time. You're kind of like, well, they're kids. Yeah. They're this age. This is common with this type of kid. With these type of kids, they're doing stupid stuff because they're young, but then they're also going way too far with the stupidity to the point mm-hmm. where it's like, kids aren't this dumb. Like, yeah. if they walk into a room and they see certain types of peripherals, they're going to know that that's what that's for. You know, mm-hmm. they're not that stupid. So anyway, without going too further into detail, it's just one of those films that like I went in thinking probably this one I actually wasn't thinking super highly of, but it even disappointed that low right. level of expectation that I had for it. So yeah, yeah, it's my number nine. All right. Number What's nine. your eight, man? You hit it here first, folks. <laughs> Mine is 47 meters down on cage. <laughs> now I will say I do like, monster mo- slash movies and mm-hmm. that's why i loved crawl a ton um and uh sharks alley any of that kind of stuff um like i really love the shallows yeah uh f- the first 47 meters down was like fine um and actually it wasn't even, actually, you know it wasn't good until i got underwater yeah so the sequel it's it's done by the same guy and there's this still like this like this I get this really like kind of slimy, arrogant vibe from the director is like Johannes something. And <laughs> um, because he's like a Johannes, I forget his last name, Robert uh, film mm-hmm. uh, directed by this. Like he's like got his, he like puts his own name in it a bunch. Like, yeah. like this is weird. Yeah. Um, but the movie is very, very silly. Um, it did have, there was some things that I really liked, <laughs> but let me just say that one of those, stupid or more stupid moments is a fish that <laughs> screams at the camera oh no yeah <laughs> ah, it's, I, like, like it's supposed Nemo to be there. a real fish and it <laughs> screams at a person oh geez i was That's like hilarious. what it screams at a person That's yes great. it screams it literally opens its mouth screams really loudly and it's effectively a jump scare is what it is oh geez yeah it was i was like what 
what in the world? <laughs> wow. Um, there were some like fun monster ish movie moments. There was, there was a, der- a blatant Sam Jackson. Mm-hmm. And I, I've said this before, but there was a blatant Sam Jackson. I've had it with these yeah, sharks. Yeah, yeah. This under 47 <laughs> meters down. Yeah, he's yeah. like, <laughs> we're not going to die today. And then you're yeah. like, and then I saw, I was like, are they going to do it? I like, yeah. oh, yep, they did it. <laughs> so it, it was, there wasn't any originality. There was some cool aspects of them like being in an underwater like city kind of a thing, like Mayan temple or something. Or I don't remember what it is. Yeah. It's kind of forgettable. Well, that's why this, the fish were screaming. They were Mayan But fish. it was <laughs> is very, very silly. Yeah. Um, and I, I usually give a very strong pass to these kinds of movies and this one couldn't overcome it. It was still still not not where even someone who like me who likes cheesy things like that sometimes. Yeah. It didn't work. Again, you'd set the bar low because you enjoy. Yeah. And then- it just didn't and even, then it was like didn't even get to, to that see, low bar. Yeah. <laughs> I was yeah. like, oh man, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, man. Yeah, it's all good. Screaming. That's fish. my number eight. Yeah, screaming fish. All right, number eight for me, Godzilla, King of the Monsters. Um, I really enjoyed the f- the first remake, the first yeah. reiteration of the Godzilla films. You and me both. Yes. We talked about it a lot. Um, really good character development, even in the beginning of the film, mm-hmm. and they they did the smart thing, which is to not make it just about Godzilla, but to make it about the people. Mm-hmm. And then Godzilla sort of his involvement with them and the yeah. impacts of it. Yep. And they did the cataclysmic, like end of the world scenario in the first film, right? Yeah. Which is that they, they again, they grounded in people so you can see the real world impacts mm-hmm. of what happens here. The worst way of doing this is kind of the old school, you know, Roland Emmerich type way of doing it, which is like, you know, you build up this giant, monstrosity of a force then it comes in and just destroys wreaks havoc on everything Mm -hmm. just destroys it all yeah and you have no real connection to any of it and things are just happening and big explosion and monster and that's kind of what this one fell into yeah um in addition to that it had so many divergent characters with their kind of like own stories Mm -hmm. and plot lines it felt like they were trying to like grow this into like a television show Yeah. yeah um so nothing really ended up connecting with me well. And then add on to that, this weird main main plot, mm-hmm. which was kind of not really the main plot, but was of why the main character was even going through this process. I, I mean, the main antagonist, not the main protagonist. Yeah. But why the main antagonist was doing what they were doing. Right. So it felt, it felt manipulated at the beginning, but then it was like, why? Why would that translate into that right. reaction? Yeah, 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 you know, you're I you're doing. It. You're like you're going to like an eleven. <laughs> yeah, you should have gone to like a six or a seven, but you're it's going like, full on. It's like uh, trying to kill a fly with a freaking nuclear missile. Yeah, I mean, it would be like, well, you know, somebody ran into my car. Yeah. So I'm gonna get a I'm gonna get a steamroller and run over every car. Right. You know, sort of. But it's like you're using a car to exact vengeance against cars because cars cause it. It's like you're, yeah. you're causing an issue that is what should be preventing you from wanting that issue from happening. Right. It's weird. Um, so it didn't really relate to me. Um, and then there was kind of like a late, late film shift of, you know, the main emphasis of the story and the character that was motivating it. And yep. I liked the, the monster action. Like yeah. that was fun. I thought yeah. that was better in this film than the first one because the first one was so quick. You know, you would get to it and then it would be like, no more. Yeah. Um, that might just been a budget thing, but I don't know. It just fell flat. Yeah. Again, this was one, this was one that I actually did have hopeful expectations for mm-hmm. and, and just didn't get it. Yeah, for sure. So, for sure. There you go. Number yeah. Eight. All right. Number seven. Number seven, Matt. One of your honorable mentions or dishonorable mentions. Mm. Uh, Velvet Buzzsaw. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, disappointing. Um, I thought it was more going to be, it reminded me of like, like fine art meets like final destination kind mm-hmm. of a thing. And it's not really what we got. It was really bizarre and, yeah. and, and in a way that I don't think was good. <laughs> and they focused on characters more than what I feel like the main plot of the story should have been. Yeah. Um, and I think this one was one of the disappointment factors. I was like, Oh, that sounds clever. Like I was yeah. excited to see it. And because it was uh, the follow up to nightcrawler essentially. And yeah. nightcrawler was, incredible although it is one of those movies where uh i thought it was really great but i don't want to watch it again you yeah. know kind of a thing yeah but um i was so i was excited to see this one yeah and experience it and it was just it was a complete letdown for yeah. me 
but um, no, I, agree. I I liked uh, I mean I liked some of the performances in it, but other than that, um, yeah, yeah, you didn't even know like in a good horror movie, you you pretty much know who's the good bad guys. Right what the stakes are, why they're doing what they're doing. Everybody's a bad guy in this yeah, movie. Everybody's so. a bad guy. You don't even really meet yeah. the bad force, like the the negative monster force until like almost halfway through the film. And it, yeah. And then you're still thinking, is it a joke? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and you're the, thinking the way that it ends, yeah. I was just like, what? Yeah. yeah. So I did yeah, I did not have a not have a good time with it either, man. Yeah. So, okay. Cool. Yeah, that was my number seven. Well, my number seven one you already mentioned as well mm. film called dumbo 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 i uh i am not a big fan i've not been loving uh these live action remakes that disney's been doing i get why they're doing them one money two yep. i believe a lot of it i've heard is they're trying to um restart their um whatever you got their property their live action properties yeah. yeah they're trying to well they're trying to basically lock down the copyrights on those properties because they were about to like pass expire? or something expire. Really? Yeah. I thought yeah, they so just hold that forever. No, there's an expiration date on any like- I thought it was only expiration if it wasn't from the original studio. No. No? no. Okay. Like All even right. Mickey or Peter Pan Like I know that's what Terminator had been doing. Right. Like every country, um, if there's an intellectual property, then that only goes for like, I think 30 years or something. And they oh. change it. It's the, okay. the rules have changed and something. It depends on the country. Like there's British ones and there's American ones. These were like close to passing. Yeah. Um, I think Disney has actually been a big um, force in uh, trying to get the Congresses to pass laws that extends that because they know that if they lose yeah. that, they're going to lose a ton of money. Yeah. Um, they could have just done a, a spinoff. They could have done a television show on Disney Plus. Yep. <clears throat> you know, they could have done a, whatever remake of, you know, one of the side characters story or something like that. Mm -hmm. Instead, they decided, hey, we're going to do these live action remakes. And instead, what, what I feel like we're getting is we're, like, we're trying to get, they're trying to take like the films, which had a timelessness to them. Yeah. Because they were designed in a different era with a different mindset. And they're trying to like modernize them and update them mm -hmm. and create realistic aspects to them. And in so doing, a lot of times, and we'll talk about this with another film I have coming up a little bit later, yeah. but they shift the focus, like you said, away from what originally the story was about yeah. to like a family yep. or like the, a kid or a yeah. business or like, and you're like, what? it's called Dumbo. Yeah. Why is only 10% to 15% of the film actually about Dumbo? Right, right, you right. You know, the exactly. original film was really about this poor little elephant. It was a short movie. It was a circus. So I know they had yeah. to like, fill, they wanted to fill something, but I think they were just try, and they I were think, trying too hard to relate right. the movie to something where- I think all this would have been fine with adding more to the, the human element, adding more sure. of the characters in there. But they created every, all these human elements so much yeah. to the point where it diluted it was Dumbo's too much. story. It like was way too much, for 10, sure. 50%, and then you get, and it was, it was just, the not only that, but it had a weird tone. I get the whole, you know, what Tim Burton's, his style is like, and I, I like yeah. some of his films. Um, I like his style at times, but I didn't really get what he was going for with this. Um, it just was weird. It, yeah. it felt so strange to me in yeah. so many ways. And then you get to the epic conclusion and it's like, well, they're not going to kill Dumbo yeah. or something. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like, all right, and it's like a kid's the, movie. I mean, like the worst twist yeah, in a kid's movie so ever. So they're going to have a hopeful ending. It was like, you get to the very end and it's like turned it, it was almost like, um, you know, out of Africa meets Dumbo where it's like, you know, oh, mm -hmm. we got to set Dumbo into free into right. the, and it's like, but he's not like a normal elephant. Right. And, uh, you know, it's not like there's a do herd of things. flying elephant out there. <laughs> you know, I think the right. reason why, and then this is the last thing I'll say and we'll move on for me. Um, the original film was like, it was a fable. It was a cartoon. It was fake. It was like almost like a story that's passed down yeah. that you know could never take place, but it has like these modern, these inclinations of like what it means, deeper meaning and yep. things like this. This film, it was like they tried to ground it and make it realistic, but also fantastical. make it so fantastical. Yeah. And it was like, you're not hitting either one. Yeah. So it just, it was, yeah. and then at the very end, they tried to ground it and make it real. Verisimilitude. Yeah. Verisimilitude. There you yes, go. Yes. Exactly. Um, so I, I did not enjoy it. I yeah. did not like yeah. you, Dumbo, very much. Gotcha. Well, yeah. hey, we got a match there on our list. Yep. Well Number done. Six. <laughs> Number six is Gemini Man. Hey. Dun, 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 dun. Uh, besides the most atrocious like CGI person work I've ever seen in a movie What's at the wrong end. What's with your face? <laughs> <laughs> I was baffled. It was like the film had worse and worse CG as you went too. And the last like couple shots were like the worst yeah. perpetrators yeah. of it. And I was watching it and I was like, actually, that's not just a CGI face. The entire character walking in broad daylight is CGI. Yeah. And that is 
it was awful. I was like, the jean jacket or shirt or he's wearing right now, that's not even real. And yeah. I can tell it's not real. <laughs> it looks like a video game yeah. with real people. Yeah, <laughs> it I was totally get, yeah. so bad. <laughs> um, the story was okay. Um, I, I always like Will Smith. You know, I, it, it's, it's hard for me not to like him, but I really liked, I think I liked... Um, uh, Mary Elizabeth Winstead in this the most. She had this really cool um, teeth scene that was like my favorite in the movie um, that had to do with like, oh, I was just, it was great. I was like, that's awesome. Anyway, it's really cool. Makes me really excited. Makes me probably not really excited. I should say more excited for Birds of Prey because she's in that movie. Yeah. Um, yeah. She's actually, I don't know. She, every time she's in something, I'm really looking forward to uh, seeing she's stuff. She's a great actress. Yeah. I think she, a lot of her content is um, great. Yeah. She was buying by and large the best part of and it was a great movie too it was 10 cloverfield lane yeah. so i think that i think it was just it was just it was a kind of a rundown story of something that i haven't seen before and i feel like i feel like they really did weird marketing this is such a technologically advanced thing i'm like but we this is not new this is something that we've seen yeah um and they and they did it way better marvel did it better with yeah. sam jackson you know yep. and i'm like <laughs> I'm. I was just confused. This movie is so weird, and it yeah. ends, and super like it was like some sort of weird joke um, at the end with the CG yeah. young Will Smith, and um, there was there were cool action elements. Yeah, I will say that. Um, I like Will Smith. I think he's a great actor. I think he had a great amount of intense intensity in those moments, but for for the movie in its entirety, I was like this it just felt weird I, it yeah. was just a weird movie and i didn't, didn't i don't even remember it that well to be honest now <laughs> yeah uh okay so my number six yeah gemini man are you serious yeah we tied it wow up. yeah I was, okay i'm just getting there real quick because i want to talk about as yeah, well what you're saying it. um i agree with everything you're saying i think the standout badness of it was definitely the cg in so many different ways and so many different times the yeah. best part of it to me was for sure, Mary Elizabeth Winstead, as well as the action. Yeah. There was it was a little over the top at times, yeah. and like, surreal. But like kicking someone with his motorcycle wheel, like yeah, roundhouse. <laughs> um, I guess if you're believing these are super soldiers, sure. it just was kind of weird. That's like, well, that one's a normal guy. Yep. So why would he have these abilities and stuff to do these like super things? Yeah. I think the main reason that I also didn't like this film. Is and I ask my, myself the question, why? Yeah. Why, Matt? Why? 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 <laughs> when you look at the film, you go, what is this even about? Right. Because the main antagonist of the film has this thing that he's doing, which is bad, mm -hmm. but it, you like it's bad, but it's also not that bad, but it is bad, but it's not that like you get what he's doing. Yep. And then he does really bad things with it, but he has a good reason for doing it. And then you're kind of left with this, like, was he wrong? I mean, he's wrong, but like, so it was all over the place. Yeah. And they left you, like, I left me unsure of a knowledge of like exactly what any of these characters are fighting for beyond just like, I've been wronged. Mm -hmm. Bad things happen that I didn't like. So I'm going to mess stuff up. Yep. Like that was the whole feel <laughs> of it. Yeah. It was kind of going for this like anti-war yeah. vibe of like, yeah. you know, don't build up these like, you know, horrible forces and kill all these people aim pointlessly. Right. But then at the very end, it kind of backed off of that, you know? Yeah. Um, so I, I I didn't really get what it was going for. Nope. The, I could care less about most of the characters and their continuation of their story. You didn't yep. end the film thinking like, wow, I went on this great journey with all of them. You, you end the film with like, what? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Who? Huh? Why? <laughs> so, uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe I'll read the book sometime. Uh, it's supposed I've, to be a great book. I didn't so. realize there was a book, so. Yeah. But it came out a long time ago. This movie's been stuck in development for like Forever. 12 or 15 years or something. Yeah, because the book came out. It was super yeah. popular, and everybody's like, oh, we got to make it a movie, and they yeah. couldn't figure out how to do it. And yeah. Will Smith these days, you know, he's oh, taking anything Will. he can. Yeah. So, anyway. Um, okay. So, uh, my number five is Ma. Ma. Yeah, the Blumhouse uh, yeah. Octavia Spencer movie. Yeah. Um. So what are you talking about? I have a huge. Um. Well, no. I, let's just say I'm I'm very impressed. Usually, I I still am. Actually, this doesn't change anything. Blumhouse does the most impressive business model out of all yeah. production studios. They almost always make a movie on five million dollars, and then make that plus like five hundred percent the opening weekend, and yeah. then everything else is just you know extra. Yeah, and it's 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 great. They have a great thing, and they know what sells. And they know how to do it for a lot of, for a lot of the their most recent films. I have been a fan, um, 
whether you're talking about the Happy Death Day movies or you're talking about uh, the collaborations with Jordan Peele for like Us and Get Out, you know, those kind of films have been quite good, although I haven't seen it, but Black Christmas didn't do very well. Um, anyways, this film, um, it was it was kind of like unnerving, which is fine, and I like that in a movie. It was unnerving, but then it got so like just weird and with the commentary and what I had to say at the end about, you know, um, treating, you know, treating people with respect basically is what it was. Treat people with respect and kindness. And that's great. I love that message (laughs) or they're going to come back and and kill you basically (laughs) and do really weird things to you. Yeah. Um, uh, the other than Octavia Spencer, I, I thought it was, I thought she was, the only part that was memorable to me, mm-hmm. everybody else is kind of just this filler, like weird, like the main uh, protagonist is like, it's like, okay, she's just trying to like survive in high school and make it. Mm-hmm. And uh, she's curious about this person because she bought alcohol for him one time. I don't know. It was just kind of a, I don't know. It was, it was a disappointment at the end. I was like, ah, this doesn't, this isn't, it wasn't, it wasn't my kind of film. And, um, uh, not to say anything on the talent of the people. I yeah. think they gave it a go, but it's just not my just not my jam. Not your jammy jam. Not my jam. All right. Yeah. I haven't seen it. I don't think I'm going to. Yep. There's a lot of Blumhouse stuff I haven't checked out. But um, yep. my five, my number five, uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. hey This was a film that's been, for a lot of reasons, very divisive. It's getting a lot of nods for different things, I know. Too. Getting so many nods yeah. and... I have so many opinions on this film and so many opinions. I know I'm an opinionated person sometimes, especially with films, but about the people that like it and why they like it. Mm -hmm. Um, I definitely think that if you're somebody that is a fan of Quentin Tarantino, you're going to have a very mixed reaction to this. Some people that I know that are Quentin Tarantino fans loved it. Others were kind of like, eh. Yeah. Um, There's some people that are huge, like, cinema snobs. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, those people seem to like it. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's because of, you know, it's yesteryears of Hollywood and the golden era. Yeah. You know, stars and how they used to build up and spaghetti westerns and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, I think the main problem I had with this film um, was it was it was pointless. <laughs> yeah. It's the best okay. way to put it. Yeah. Um, I remember you saying that when we talked about it. Yeah. And somebody tried to say to me like, oh, well, that's the point. You know, it's showing that, you know, with all these celebrities that they, you know, there's this pointlessness to their lives and, you know, they do all this stuff and then nothing good happens for them. And I'm like, yeah, but there's like kind of a slightly happy ending for all the characters. <laughs> yeah. So they do have a point. Yeah. And then there's this whole subplot of the Manson murders that is just so thrown in there. It almost felt like, Quentin Tarantino had this film in mind, one or the other, and was like, well, I got to add more to that. And then right. put these two films together. So totally it feels like two different things. And I know that Quentin Tarantino is known for these like graphic, you know, blood, yeah. bloody moments and yeah, stuff totally. like that. And that, that hits at the very end of the film, but it didn't feel like it didn't feel um, necessary. It didn't feel like it did it in, in Inglorious Bastards, yeah. which I really love right. that movie. The violence in Inglorious Bastards was like a stylistic choice that he made. But the whole movie had show. been pretty violent up until that point, too. Right, exactly. So this film literally was like, it's a story about a guy who's having a hard time in Hollywood. And it's well acted, yeah. uh, especially by Leonardo DiCaprio. I think he's my favorite part of the whole mil- movie. Yeah. Um, and I think if it had just left it with that, of like the story of Leonardo DiCaprio trying to become more than he is and, you know, his stunt double and things like that, then it would have been an interesting film. I still would have lowly rated it, but then it takes this huge, like, sideways turn in the last, like, 10 minutes of the film. And there's, like, five or six moments where it's, like, literally, it felt like Quentin was setting you up, like, eh, someone's mm-hmm. gonna, you thought something was going to happen there, but yeah. it didn't. You thought it was, but it didn't. Like, that happened, like, <laughs> like four or five times. Okay. And so I was just kind of, like, it felt like the, like the most, like, I forget. I, I don't know exactly how you say, it, but it felt like somebody said to Quentin Tarantino, "Like, do all the things that you love the most in a film, yeah. but take put the least amount of effort yeah. into it." As far as like <laughs> really trying to do anything special, so it was like all the Quentin Tarantino isms without anything special to it. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And it's like everybody's like, "Oh my gosh, it's about old Hollywood, so it's great, <laughs> and it's Leonardo DiCaprio, so right. it's great." You know, <laughs> and they talk about the Manson murders, and that was a great violent scene, so it's great. And it's like. You can pick out one or two things about it, but nobody has sat me down and said, like, here's why this through line and theme, 
you know, and cinematography and everything makes this a great film. Yeah. They just like individual elements of it, like the the director or a certain thing. I, I'm sorry. That's probably personal for people. Sure. But, um, <laughs> that's, that's why I've had a problem with it. With a lot of people that have been like, I love that movie. Yeah. Because then I ask them why and they're like, uh, this. So anyway, uh, yeah, that's my number five. All right. Yeah, it was yeah. one of the only movies that I watched in theaters, and I was like, "Wow, I'm almost tempted to just walk out on this." As far as the the last the last five that I'm going to go through here, yeah, were all movies that I'm like, if I if I didn't have to review this, I probably would just walk out. Oh, of. for real? Yeah. yeah. But I knew that there was something that was going to happen yeah. in this film. That's what kept me engaged. Um. Okay. So these next two, um, that I'm going to talk about, uh, I'll start with four, obviously, but um, they are more of like just a disappointment, great disappointments, mm. um. Actually, you know what? I'm going to save that for this next one I'm going to talk about. My number four is Men in Black International. Mm. Um, this movie I is not very memorable. It's boring at times. The story is very weak. Mm. Um, and it doesn't do anything to really further the lore. It doesn't have any of the fun of the first movie, which I don't know if we can actually get back to that, to be honest yeah, with you. Um but I, I, at the very least, I remember, I remember specifically saying to you and a couple other people, this movie and the trailers when they came out, this looks, it looks like it's just going to be a fun time at the theater. Yeah. And I remember almost falling asleep at the end. Like I, I was just like, what um, is happening? And um, okay, I get this twist, but everything felt very forced. And um, the interactions weren't, I mean, Tessa Thompson and, um, Chris Hemsworth they have good like chemistry but I felt like it was even a little weird in this yeah um like their chemistry in Thor Ragnarok was spectacular end game mm -hmm. spectacular mm -hmm. like those kinds of things but I think this felt like more forced as of uh coming out of like like they were put together like oh they did great in Thor let's put them in this you know yeah. they'll be just fine it, it felt that part felt forced and I didn't believe any of the training stuff that happened with uh um What's her name? I just said it. <laughs> I forgot her oh, name. Tessa Thompson. Tessa Thompson. That's oh, right. Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, like, there's like this like quick montaging of training, and um, I I kind of like her backstory where she came from, but um, outside of that, it was it was like non-existent, like any other. Yeah. From from her and how she got recruited and what that looked like, it was just super fast and glossed over, and yeah. Um, they I think they should have spent more time on that. Um, but it was not fun. Yeah. Um, there's only one line that I remember from it and that's because I quote it with the guy that I saw it with, friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And um and that's no with nothing but my wit in my forty seven or forty seven series de atomizer. Like that's what he <laughs> says. But like um it was it was just odd and not fun. I was yeah. I was just kinda bummed by yeah. that. Sorry. So, yeah, thank you for apologizing. I really need you <laughs> need your support on that you one. Need to support you on those. Yeah. Well, I know you, the, I I'm, I need support so much because yeah. these, these last ones are getting me angry again. Yeah. Which we knew was going to angry happen. face. What's yeah. your number four? Number four, Aladdin. Hey. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Uh, that was okay. Talking about screen chemistry, the the two main you know romantic folks. I felt like Jafar yeah. had better chemistry in this film. Uh, with our Jasmine mm. than Aladdin did in this film. They they felt like, literally felt like, yeah, a street urchin and a, a princess. Mm -hmm. um, one of the main problems was that I didn't feel like the acting was all that great from pretty much anybody mm. except for Jafar. I thought okay. Jafar had a pretty good acting job. Um, the other main problem that I have with this film is it's not Aladdin. It's the adventures of Aladdin and his friends and the world <laughs> that they live in. Everybody in this yeah. film, they're like, you get a backstory to develop. You get a backstory. To develop. Everybody in this film I has to itchy, have. to be honest with you. It probably was, but it was like the film was so little about Aladdin. Aladdin, he had even, if anything, the least amount of development that his character had to go through. Like literally his development was like, I lied and I feel bad because I'm poor. Yeah. Everybody else was like, you know, well, I don't want to be forced to get married and I should be queen. And Jeannie's like, well, I'm a slave and I yeah. want to be free. Yeah. And, you know, I have all these horrible things. And Jafar is like, I've been treated like this, like contemptuous, horrible person. And yeah. I'm above that now. Like everybody has that except for Aladdin, who's basically like, well, I lied and I'm in love and yeah. I want to get, you know, a wife and <laughs> not be street urchin. It's like, and so all the other plot lines are more interesting. Um, the 
the songs in this version were like different and not better. They were just different. Yeah. Um, if anything worse, um, they spent so much time with Will Smith. It made no sense to cast Will Smith and to force it into this thing where you have to make him look like a Will Smith genie. Mm. You know what I mean? I actually thought it was better than what the trailers it perceived it to be. Definitely better than the trailers, yeah. but it was still like it doesn't. He doesn't look like a genie really. He just looks like. What a do dude. genies actually look like, Joel? I'm just talking about in comparison. To that. I'm just talking about in comparison to the original I version, know, which I this know. is supposed to be a spiritual successor for. It just felt pointless. You know what I mean? There was nothing sure. about even Abu, who's like one of my favorite side characters from all the Aladdin's yeah. one of my favorite Disney movies. Um, he felt pointless. Nothing in this film like rang with any heart. Like when all the bad stuff is happening, happening to all the characters, I'm kind of mm. just like, okay, that stinks. Yep. Too bad for you. <laughs> Uh, and I ended up getting angry because I know that there's a much better story in this. Uh-huh. There's much better songs in this. There's mm-hmm. much better, you know, style in this film than to just talk about like five or six different characters going through. It was like the Aladdin, the melodrama, yeah. you know, okay. it's like if they wanted to turn it into like a soap <laughs> opera with all their characters having their own things going on <laughs> and then add songs. So oh I, I just really didn't like it. It was one of the films that I saw in the year that kind of upset me. I got gotcha. you. Especially when you have such good source material yeah. that you can go with. So, yeah. yeah, it's my number four. Gotcha. Cool. Well, let me bring you down to my number three. And this one comes with a ton of disappointment because I do like this franchise as a whole. And it is X-Men Dark Phoenix. Hey, I didn't actually see that one. It probably would have been on mine if I'd yeah, seen it. Yeah, dude. So disappointing. Um, it's... I saw it presented this way. It's the guy who did the least favorite X-Men film in the original trilogy, the third one, The Last Stand, yeah. wrote and directed this one. <laughs> I don't know like how he got that. Yeah. Like I'm bummed out. Um I don't know. Ugh, Brian Singer. He, they should have kept him. I actually liked the previous two films. Yeah. Um, I even really liked Apocalypse more than I feel like most people. A lot of people hated on Apocalypse, but yeah. I thought it was okay. Yeah. 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 Um, and I, I would have preferred to see Brian stay on board. This, the story, it's uh, so dramatic. It backslides on um, uh, James McAvoy's Charles Xavier's character a little bit, like yeah. makes him into a bad guy kind of. And, the I know there was a ton of like reshoots. It starts off kind of cool, but there was a ton of reshoots and stuff towards the end, and a lot of it kind of fell in between the Disney Fox merger. Don't know what was affected there at all, if anything. But I think that it should have been just in different hands, just yeah. the whole project in general. Um, and they, I feel like they just they got rid of some characters, and they even alluded to like specific characters' deaths in the trailers. Um, and it was just, and even the end, it's, it's, it wasn't satisfying. It wasn't like even hopeful for that matter. And, um, it, it was less emphasis on like mutants as a whole and more emphasis just on like this thing that Jean Grey is going through. Yeah. And I, I like, like one thing I liked about the other movies was this, like you get a sense of like, you know, Xavier's school for the gifted and all the things that are happening, the people that are involved and what's happening, but they just kind of gloss by a few things. And then they were like, let's just get back to this like little story (laughs) over here. And it was so disappointing. It was, ah, I was just really bummed out. And that's, I, that's probably the biggest explanation as to why I can put it on this list as one of my most disappointing movies of this year Mm. for sure. Well, my number three, then, um, men in black international. Hey, Oh, we already talked about it a lot, so I won't say too much more. Sure. Uh, again, I think completely we're saying Chris Hemsworth and T- Tessa Thompson, really no chemistry on screen. I think one of the other things that it did was a real disservice for the Men in Black as a whole is they're trying to create, obviously they're trying to like reignite the franchise yeah. to like do more things. They turned the Men in Black agency into a joke. You yeah. know what I mean? That it could literally have be infiltrated by, by this one-off person yeah. that just researched them and then just joined their ranks you know, there was a yep. cool thing about the original Men in Black Agency that it was kind of like this huge mechanism that you just never saw. You know, yep. it was in operation all over the world and all these different things. And in that film, Will Smith was perfect for that because he's like this small cog, like a squeaky cog yep. in a much bigger mechanism. Yep. Tessa Thompson is like, the, she's the same fish out of water, but she knows everything. She understands everything. She gets, she knows exactly how it works. Yep. She's more gifted and talented 
than the people that have been there for all this time in yeah. a lot of ways. So it's like, how am I really going to root for you when you've already accomplished <laughs> I know. everything? And it also made the, the agency look stupid because yeah. it's like, so all this stuff happens at the beginning of the film and they don't even recognize that she still knows. Like they yeah. always had all these processes, like they could shoot off the light on the top of the Statue of Liberty and like completely, you know, blank everybody's memory in the entire, right. you know, right. New York yeah. area. It's like, <laughs> You, you're you supposed to have these things worked out and figured out. And instead, this it's just like the agency is falling apart. There's all these issues. And then this one person who's supposed to be the person we connect with comes in and is just completely like bulldozes over everybody. Right. Um, I think, honestly, personally, Chris Hemsworth was really not a great casting for this as well. Yeah. You know, he was supposed to be playing this like really effective but um, kind of burnt out type agent. And then there's this twist later on in the story that is supposed to explain why he's that way, yep. but it just felt so phoned in. There was no real significance. There was no real evidence of that until the very end. Yep. There was a weird romantic thing that happens at the end of the film that made no sense. Yep. Um, there was no real connection to like the, there's supposed to be like a sadness, almost like a morning of loss that happens in the film. There's no real connection to that. Um, they had like a, a really annoying side character, that comes in that it literally was probably just there for like, well, we need something for the kids to think's fun and yeah. funny. <laughs> Even though he was probably the funniest part of the movie, yeah. he was stupid and it made yeah. no sense for him to be alive yeah. when everybody else was dead. Right. Um, and I, I mean, I did some research into the production of this thing. It, it went through some pretty bad turmoil with the production aspects yeah. and last minute changes and rewrites and re-edits and reshoots and all this stuff. Um, which reshoots in and of themselves aren't a bad thing, but this yeah. film went through a lot. So I'm not surprised it didn't perform, right. but it literally felt like a film that could have had some heart, could have had some interest. If they literally just brought in Tessa Thompson and made her like a new Will Smith, yeah, that would have been enough for me to like connect me with her story and move it through. Yep. But like there was no reason she wasn't already an agent. Like yeah. she should have already just been an agent yep. instead of like, oh well, we gotta have this intro story where she meets this creature and mm -hmm. it's like dumb. Yeah. So yep. <laughs> so did not like it, would not see, recommend it to anybody or a yeah. sequel. Yep. Anyway. Same Z's. Number two. Number two is Hellboy. Oh, I did see this one recently. So this one was, um, this one was disappointing to me. I was actually a big fan of Guillermo del Toro, uh, Hellboy 1 and 2. Mm -hmm. um, and I, the big thing that they were promoting for this movie was, this is the R-rated version, more true to the <laughs> comic books. Yeah. And um, and it didn't actually make for a better movie. Um, it it made for something less enjoyable. Um, I it makes you it makes you appreciate Guillermo's like design aesthetic, like his eye for things, like mm -hmm. kind of like what you see with like Pan's Labyrinth or any anything for that matter that he's involved in, and even um, uh, Pacific Rim, yep. that kind of a thing. And I think that. Um, this this movie took David Harbour, which we all love David Harbour, and the, I feel like they gave him his personality was not on par with what like Ron Perlman's was. Yeah. And there was it was it was lacking um a lot of that charming and charisma, I feel like. And I don't think it was David Harbour's fault. I think it was just the scripting yeah. and what the you know, what he was given to work with. Um, and a lot of times this movie is just strictly there, there were a couple of cool action sequences and I did like some of the design aesthetics. There were some like really like gnarly looking things. Yeah. But, um, especially later on. Yeah. 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 And towards the end of the movie. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot. Yeah. Um, but a lot of it just seemed to be like, let's make it as gory as we can right now. And yeah. like, let's have that be like the highlight of the thing. And, I remember there was an Instagram ad one time before going to see the movie and I was like, Oh, it was like, it was like, this is like the R rated version as it's been intended or whatever. And it was like, uh, it was like cut scenes of like all these like really graphic bloody images. Mm -hmm. And it was literally giving away the whole last like 20 minutes of the movie. <laughs> yeah. I was like, that's the whole, that's all the things that they showed in the ad. Anyways, um, pretty um forgetful um i was very disappointed i was expecting that us to like get something really cool that we could you know relaunch this franchise with and it's not what we got um just just sad kind of yeah I, I would i didn't see the movie last year i just yeah. saw it recently yeah i probably should have put it on dishonorable mentions but i just saw it yeah like literally in the first 10 minutes i'm like you lost me yeah the movies you're supposed to be 
rooting in the first 10 minutes for the person that ends up supposed to be the bad person. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so you're like, well, what am I doing here now? Like I'm supposed to be rooting for the bad guy or girl, if you will. Yeah. Uh, but then at the very end, they're like, no, they are the bad guy. Yeah. It's yep. like, what? Yeah. So there was nothing, there was no, the only stakes were there was like, yeah. who's going to die and how? Not my, like, not my Hellboy. Yeah, not my Hellboy. My Hellboy Hashtag is. Hashtag not my Hellboy. Yeah, my Hellboy is uh, Ron Perlman. <laughs> yeah. Through and through. Um, anyways, that's my number two. Anyway. All right. My number two. <sighs> Lion King. Oh. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I was okay. I'm not, it's not on my worst of list. There but, was, yeah, it was just okay. nothing about this movie beyond the fact that it looked so real. Yeah. That it in any way was redeemable to me. Sure. Um, Aladdin and Lion King are probably tied as probably like my favorite like Disney cartoons yeah, of that totally. era. I love that like the songs and the the visual style mm-hmm. and you, the the embracing of like the African culture and with even with the music and the lighting, you know, and the cinematography and the pacing of the the movie is quick, but it's it's got moments of like depth. You know, where like you're literally, right. it's one of the only cartoons I've ever seen besides a couple Pixar movies where like I actually tear up, Yeah. you know, at a couple parts. And it's got such a timeless story of like, you know, you know, deeper meaning and like what, you know, when bad things happen to you, how to recover from those like, yeah. really horrible things that can happen to you in your life and why that can give you like a resolve to do things better. And, yeah. and you know, there, there were so many deeper elements to that film. And then this one comes along and it's like, we're going to do that, but like minus (laughs) 75%. You know, even the songs, like my favorite song from the original is Be Prepared. is like literally just, you know, Scar walking around going, be prepared. Yeah. Be be prepared. Hey guys, be prepared. Spoken word. Yeah. You know, and it was such a bad choice to go with non-emoting animal faces. Right. Which literally, so it just looks like. Talking. I think ju- that's the only reason why Jungle animals. Book worked is it had at least Mowgli. Yeah. This yeah. one, there was no, there was no person to interact, and and I think that was the biggest thing. There was no emotions. Agreed, and I feel like that's where they went with. They're like, well, it worked for Jungle Book cause in a lot of ways. Right. Why don't we just do it again? I mean, they, there was a couple of like times where they like, I like, I know Timon specifically where they do like expressive eyebrow things, but yeah. nothing. I mean, but nothing Even, that. Sorry. Translates with the rest up. of the animals. Yeah. I was just like, good. Even, and people have done this side-by-side comparisons, like not just the visual style, but even the audio and the voiceover work, especially with the younger kids. Yeah. You know, there was so many things about this version that, except, you know, maybe for James Earl Jones, but even he at times felt a little bit like kind of phoning it in. There was so many times where this, just, where- He's just getting up there in Yeah, age. it's the age maybe, but yeah. nothing about their voiceovers felt like- realistic or intense like you know and a, a spoiler in a super, certain sense like when Mufasa falls and dies like in the original <gasps> he dies? Yeah. <laughs> and the original you know when Simba's watching that and he's like no yeah. and he's like sad you can hear it in his voice and, and it's scared. just like a lion face yeah like a regular lion face yeah saying, this one it's no. like and somebody said this it's like he <laughs> dropped his iPad you yeah know? Like, no <laughs> you know and it's I'm, I'm over exaggerating it but yeah. it really felt that way everything in this yeah. felt like oh no I dropped my iPad instead of like wow my whole world is dying right. you know the first one the the relationship between the hyenas yeah. and the silliness and the goofiness and the yeah. way they interact with each other because they only had their own personality right, 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 right. and played off each other with Whoopi goldberg and everything was they so great yeah, yeah, yeah. you know and they didn't have that in this one yep. you know there was so many things about this one and the way they changed the dialogue to try and like update it for modern times didn't do anything for me yeah like it wasn't funny it wasn't creative it felt very flat so th- again, this might not have been the worst film of the year. Sure, like there was redeemable aspects to this film, but it upset me. Yeah, yeah. Personally, as a big fan of Lion King, it felt so phoned in and forced that I just I was I'm done. So yeah. filmmakers, take a lesson from this day yes. that you do not upset Joel. Please do not, because even if your movie's okay, if you upset him, it will go straight to the bottom of the barrel. Exactly. That's what's happening. All right, <laughs> are you ready for my number one worst movie of 2019? I'm ready, Matt. <sighs> It is the 2019 film starring Matthew McConaughey and Anne Hathaway (laughs) called Serenity. Hey, I didn't see it. Yes. It's terrible. (laughs) It's terrible. It's just the worst movie. (laughs) I think I heard about it. Is this the one that- We talked about it. The twist is something, it's like, yeah. I'm going to, you know, I don't care. I will so spoil this movie. Spoil it away. Okay. I'm spoiling Serenity. If you didn't see it, you don't need to. And- if you were planning on seeing it, then I don't understand why you waited a whole year to wait and see it. So anyways, 
Um, You're not the, missing anything. There's the whole movie. It's just like just this melodrama of this fisherman trying to catch a fish that's right. elusive and. Um, but he's supposed to kill, like, right? Kill or be killed. Yeah, sort of yeah, thing. yeah, yeah, yeah. He's asked to like kill the husband right. of this or this abusive husband <laughs> yeah. to Anne Hathaway, and yeah. he, um, <laughs> he, uh, um, throughout this thing, you get this interaction. Like, he gets like these messages, and these messages that we find out are coming from, um, they're coming from his son. Because his son created this whole world that Matthew McConaughey lives in <laughs> yeah. in a computer game. <laughs> I remember, I remember I hearing like, that. I was like, what? Was, yeah. <laughs> it's the most bizarre like twist <laughs> oh, and geez. just like really weird thing. And like so this kid was trying to get him to kill his father. In real life, in, like, but in a video game world. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's so weird, dude. Yeah. And I was like, this is so like the movie is like just not very good to begin with, so it's not like it the twist ruined the movie. Yeah, it's like it just added to something that was already bad, and and it was just like what and <laughs> um and the fact that you got to you know obviously the kid's gone through some traumatic stuff, but the fact that he's like saying some of these things and doing some of these things and. And and it's it's an R rated movie, so like Matthew McConaughey and, and Diane Lane are like together in a few scenes. Yeah. And I'm like, so is the kid interact? Is he making this happen? Yeah. Like what? When you really started breaking down. There's a lot of like, like this, this is weird. This is weird and yeah. icky a little bit. Yeah. Um, but I don't know what happened. I don't know why Anne Hathaway and Matthew McConaughey are in this movie. It's it's oh. probably one of those things where the screenplay was like seemed really good and they just could not pull it off yeah. in a way that would be any type of successful. The idea was better than the actual. Yes, when 100%. They, when they got in there and they made it, yeah. It was awful. Yeah. It was a bad movie. So I'm sad to say. Yeah, Actually, I, I'm not sad to say. I'm, I'm, it's just a terrible movie. I heard about that twist before I heard about anything else about the movie. Oh, really? And yeah, I was oh. like, have you heard about that movie <laughs> where the guy's so... like killing his, like in a video game? And I was like, what? Yeah. Like, yeah, it's ready. Yeah. yeah. It's so dumb. I'm, yeah. I would I would probably rate this one, that one pretty highly. If I'd That's seen it. my number one worst movie. Okay. All right. My number one drum roll. And everybody's going <laughs> to think this is a stupid one to put my top one, but I'm doing it anyways because it was the one I had the worst time with. Uh, the what Kid is... Who Would Be King. Oh, that movie was, for me, it was really mediocre. It was... Okay, there's a number of movies each year that I watch where I'm expecting, okay, this is like a kid's movie or something. Sure. Or there's some like thing they're going for, and I'm like, it just doesn't land. That movie quite was right. really long, wasn't it? It was a very, very long movie. It's a two-hour long movie. It didn't need to be that didn't long. It didn't need to be that long. I remember thinking long. like, wow, this isn't over yet. I'm it like, was okay, yeah. a half hour I to 45 you. minutes too long. Yep. The entire movie was stupid and pointless. Yeah. The entire movie, to me, yeah. was... Like it was literally like a kid, like a five year old, like somewhere between five and ten year old, sat down and was like, "Yeah." And then they did this, and then they went here, and then there was this bad guy, but like he didn't do anything. <laughs> but then he like hit that guy, and that was really painful. But he got up, and then they went to the school, and then they, at the school they had to band together, and it didn't make any real impact with anything. Like nothing yeah. made any sense. It was stupid. It like taught kids that they should engage in imagining things to the point where literally they just do whatever they want, which I think is like a bad lesson that like, basically like if your parents are telling you not to do something, yeah, but you feel really strongly, like you should do it anyways, or like authority figures, then just do it because yeah, it's more is. important that you do what you want, you know? So like, I'm just thinking of Merlin's like hand gestures. Oh like, yeah. And then you get to the hand gestures and you get to the Merlin and his stupidity. Must be the Naruto actually. It, it kind of is like so. Naruto, yeah. Um, and it builds up to this uh, epic, I'm saying epic battle in the school. The battle for junior high. Was like, yeah. It was so <laughs> like, and it was like, it's, it's so hard to explain. It's like literally somebody wrote a rough draft of a script mm -hmm. and then was like, Hey, here's a, you know, here's a rough cut of the script. I'm like, all right, let's film it. And they're like, yeah. wait, you're not going to do anything. Yeah. You're not going to change it. And I just, I, I watched it. It was so boring. I was not tired, but I felt tired after I got out. I felt annoyed. It was kind of and boring. I think it's annoying to me because there's so few films, you know, by major studios these days that they make and they could spend more time, making films and putting together something that actually like does something fun and is clever and goes somewhere. And this literally felt like the lowest common denominator for everybody, like loosely 
loosely wrap it into like King Arthur, you know, try yep. and tie some stuff in like that, make it fun. You know, it, it wasn't fun. It wasn't clever. It wasn't enjoyable. Right. I wish that they would make films that they actually felt like they were trying. Yeah. You know, I think that's the big thing. Hollywood doesn't feel like it's trying yeah. in a lot of ways. It was just so symbolic of everything <laughs> that Hollywood is doing these days of just trying to make money and not yep. even caring about what they put out. So um, I fell victim to that. I watch movies all the time that I know are like just sequels and because I'm a fan of the franchise. But it just it frustrates me when you see things like this come out. Yeah, no, you know? I get it. So I get it, man. I'm sure there's kids out there. There's probably some young boys and maybe girls that are watch this film and like, oh, it's so fun. It's right. like a kid and is fighting and does it. <laughs> but it just was not my jam. Gotcha. Yeah. Anyway, Matt. Right. Top ten worst. That was it. Done. That was our top ten worst for the year. I think I managed to keep it mostly under wraps this year. Yeah, that was good. I am upset. Yeah, but I'm gonna go eat a sandwich or something. Yeah, and I think I'll be get okay. happy again. Yes, get happy. Find my happy place. <laughs> go watch some of your top ten again. I will do that. Yeah. yeah. Um. Well, with that being said, we're gonna go wrap things up. Some ways to get connected. Just as a reminder, uh, realviewmedia.com, where you can get connected to our podcast episodes as they come out. Uh, we have our Facebook, which is facebook.com/slash/realreviewmedia. We have Instagram and Twitter, which are both at Real Review Media. And then our email, realreviewmedia at gmail.com. Let us know your thoughts and perspectives on your top 10 or worst of uh, what we put together, what you think, and other films you've had a chance to see. Again, as always, real is spelled R-E-E-L. We would love to hear all of your inputs. Like a movie reel. Like a movie, yeah. So yep. with that, we're going to get back into our actual film reviews yep. coming up. Uh, lots of stuff to talk about and probably totally. our predictions or thoughts on the coming Oscars. Oscars. Academy Awards. Totally. Anything else, Matt? No, that's it. All right. Well, it's been real. It's been real.